everyone. Today we are going to be taking a look at the life of Lydia. Now she's a person in the Bible that you may not have heard of because she doesn't have a ton of verses written about her. However, if she was important enough to include in scripture, she's important enough for us to study. So here we are at the beginning of chapter 16 and Paul is on his second missionary journey. <clears throat> now, if you don't know who Paul is, he is a Jewish convert to Christianity, and his conversion was quite a miraculous event, um, definitely worth checking into. And he went from being a persecutor of Christians to a Christian that is spreading the gospel. He was quite integral to uh, getting the gospel to the world. Uh, big, <laughs> big deal so to speak, and here it is, he's going on his second missionary journey. Now, a missionary journey is a journey uh, like any other, but the sole purpose of your journey is to preach God's word. It's to share the gospel with others. So it's a little different than what uh, many of our missionaries do, where they go to a city and then they stay there, right? And they help build the community and, and do that. This is different. He goes from city to city to city, preaching God's word, and then helping them get started, but then he moves on um, to a different city to preach the gospel to more people. And so that's what he's doing. This is his second time around doing it. <laughs> and he has with him Silas and Luke. Luke is there to record things. Um, he wrote the gospel of Luke, and if you look back there, he was writing to somebody named Theophilus about what has been going on with Jesus. And this is kind of a continuation of that. He's there to record, although he does participate in some of the things. And we see that they pick up Timothy as well, okay? And so that's kind of what's going on here. I'm going to pull up a map so you can see what's going on. You're like, oh, not maps, right? Um, sorry, guys, I'm a lover of maps. But the maps actually help us see what exactly these men are um, our journeying, how it's happening, and it's relevant to Lydia. So I'm going to pull it up here and show you exactly where they started and where they are headed. Paul and Silas start their missionary journey here in Antioch, okay? And they go through this area here, Cilicia, and they stop in these three towns here, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And this is where they pick up Timothy. Timothy is going to accompany them. And so that's where this starts. They go this way, and they're heading through uh, Galatia, uh, Phrygia, basically Asia. Uh, this is uh, modern-day Turkey kind of right here. And so they're going through here, but the Holy Spirit is preventing them from sharing the gospel here. So the Holy Spirit's just kind of saying, nope, 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 keep on going. So you can see they're passing up a lot of towns. And so they decide, okay, well, maybe maybe the Holy Spirit wants to go north, right? So they try to go up that way. The Holy Spirit, again, is like, nope, guys, not where you're going. So they keep on traveling, and they finally get to the city of Troas. Now, why did they stop in Troas? Simply because to go further would be the Aegean Sea. So they stop in Troas. Um, this is a city that's a little south of the city of Troy. You can see this right here. And Troy was where an ancient battle happened. You may recall in mythology some of that. And the Romans at this time believed that they were descendants from these people of Troy. And so this kind of area was really important to the Romans uh, who kind of owned all this. So they stop in Troas and it's here that Paul receives a vision of a Macedonian man who is asking him to please come and help us. And so he tells this to uh, his fellow journeymen and they hop on a boat and with a small stop here in Samothrace, they make it all the way over to Neapolis. And Neapolis is a port city, uh, but that was not where their journey stopped. They actually continued 10 miles to the city of Philippi. And this is within Europe, so you can kind of see the different colors from here to here. This delineates Asia, and of course this over here is going to be Europe. So they get to Philippi, and this is where we are going to pick it up in the Bible in chapter 16 of Acts. Okay, so the men are now in Philippi, and they spend a few days there. Um, there's no synagogue. So when it gets to be the Sabbath, they go out of the city to uh, basically a river, 
Okay, they're looking for water. And the reason they're doing this is because if there's no synagogue, then um, Jewish believers would find a place where they could go to ceremonially cleanse themselves and be able to pray and worship God. Now, we see here that there's no synagogue. If that's the case, that means the Jewish community is super small here. Okay, in order to start a synagogue, you had to have 10 married Jewish men. Okay, so we can see that if there's no synagogue, that there is likely fewer than 10 married Jewish men. And so that's why they headed out of the city <laughs> to go find the faithful who would be gathered at most likely a river. And so they go out there and they come across a group of women who are praying to God. And this is where we're going to pick it up. Acts chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Okay, so we see here that the men came upon a group of women. We don't know how many they were, and we don't know how many were of Jewish ethnicity. So uh, we are in an area of the world that was not <laughs> where Jewish communities were. Um, and so we don't know if these were transplants, like people who, who were Jewish, maybe from Israel who had come there for business, or if they were converts. We aren't for sure. But we do know that Lydia was there, and she was not from Israel. <laughs> she was actually from Thyatira. And so let's look at that for a minute. I'm going to go back to our trusty map. Here that Lydia is currently in Philippi. However, she's not from there. She is way over here in modern day Turkey in Thyatira. Now, next to Thyatira, you will see this box with a cross on it. Now that means that there was a church there. However, it is unclear that there was a church there at the time of Lydia's conversion. In fact, um, it's believed by some people that it wasn't until later on um, that the, the church was there, specifically Acts 19, or it could have even been not by Paul. It could have been started otherwise. But we do know that um, by the time we get to Revelation being written in chapter 2, uh, Thyatira's church is mentioned as one of the seven churches. So she is from Thyatira, and this city right here is known for quite a few things. They were very much known for their textiles, and textiles is just another word for things that require cloth. So you think anything from like rugs to... Um, to clothing, to drapes, to anything that involves cloth. And so she was specifically someone who sold purple dyed goods, okay? Uh, these purple dye is what made these things so expensive. Um, usually people who owned purple dyed things were royalty or wealthy, uh, highly wealthy. <laughs> and the reason it's so expensive um, was basically how they got the purple dye um, some people believe that this was a, a purple dye made out of snails, uh, as in some other areas in that day, which it takes 10,000 snails to make one gram of dye. So that's very expensive. Some other people think that they did this through a root, and that's where we get the Turkish red color that we have now. Um, either way, super expensive, super labor intensive, and they were known for it. So she sold these goods, and that's... Um, that was her business, and she did that. Uh, the goods were from here, Thyatira, and she was selling them over here in Philippi. And so that's how far away she was from her hometown. Now, you can't see it on this map, but this area right here that I'm kind of circling was known as the region of Lydia. We know a lot about Thyatira, the city, as, historically, as far as you know, who conquered it and who ruled it and when certain things came about. And it is still a city today, although it's not called Thyatira. It did have a 
uh, Jewish presence there from very early on. And so, you know, that could have been where Lydia found her belief in the Jewish God. Uh, could definitely have been in her hometown of Thyatira. And so that is where she is from. Okay, so let's get back to Lydia. Here she is in Philippi. And we know that she was most likely a wealthy woman because, again, she was selling uh, such high-priced goods and those come at an extremely high cost. But also because we see that she had a household to take care of as well as she may have actually had a house in Philippi and then another house or a business in Thyatira where the goods were being made. So most likely she was a pretty wealthy woman to be able to do all that. When we look at Lydia herself, it appears that she is not married in any capacity. So this could mean three things. It could mean that she was a freed woman who made her own way, uh, you know, and just kind of accumulated wealth and therefore she had a household. Households can include people uh, beyond family. So servants, workers, those types of people are also included. Slaves, of course, too. Um, she could have been a widowed woman and inherited the business and ran it, right? Maybe they didn't have any children, any male children to give it to. And she could have been a divorced woman with the same thing, right? That out of the divorce settlement, she ends up with the business. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Um, but those are kind of the three options that, that are out there for her. And so for whatever reason, she's on her own here. <laughs> and she has got a, a business selling purple goods that makes her a wealthy woman. And so we see that the Holy Spirit is working on her, right? It talks about how the Holy Spirit opens up her heart to hear the message that Paul has. And so when she hears it, because the Holy Spirit has been preparing her heart, she is quick to believe. She uh, converts, you know, on the spot and she gets baptized immediately. But not just her. She goes and tells her household, right, all of those people who uh, she's in, in charge of and, and is responsible for. And they, in turn, also get baptized. Now, there's some debate here. Um, you know, did the household really believe? Um, there was a custom that, you know, uh, they would follow in the footsteps of the leader. So if Lydia, as the head of this household, if she converted to Christianity, then they would too. And, and then the house would be known as a Christian home that follows Christian principles and morals. Now, that could have been the case. It also could have been the case that they completely had faith and they converted as well wholeheartedly. Um, and, you know, you can look to the fact that <laughs> here it is that Paul, uh, they baptize these people. And, and it would be hard to think that uh, they would baptize people who didn't fully believe. But either way, whichever camp you decide to be in, <laughs> uh, we don't know. She became, to, to the best of our knowledge, Europe's first convert. So if you remember back to the map, we showed the different colors, right? We went from Asia into Europe, and she's the first convert to Christianity. And so this really goes to show that, um, in case you weren't aware, um, uh, Christianity didn't start as, as a European religion. It came out of Asia, specifically Middle East, um, what we call the Middle East, they didn't call it that, um, but out of the Asian continent. And so here, Paul, this is after Jesus has died, resurrected, come back to earth, and then gone to heaven, right? It's after all that that we see Europe's first convert in Lydia, a woman. Now, she impressed upon the missionaries to stay with her, okay? And so we see not only did she immediately uh, walk in obedience by getting baptized. Not only did she immediately start to evangelize to her household and they followed with baptism, but then she impressed upon the missionaries to stay with her. And, you know, this is a mark of servanthood that Christians are called to have, right? Is that we are serving others. And so she immediately knew that these men would need a place to stay and she offered up her house. This also backs up why we believe she was wealthy because here it is, she's got four men staying in her house. Not just that, but she's got to feed them and meet their needs, whatever those would be. And so she impresses upon them to stay with her. And there may have been some back and forth here because we read that she finally says, guys, you know, if you really believe that I have faith, then you're not going to turn down my offer. You will come stay at my house. <laughs> and they did. 
Okay, and so <clears throat> this is where we get into um, what the the men did from there. So they're staying at her house. Um, she's feeding them. You know, anything they need that she's she's providing. And they continue their work in Philippi. And one of the things that Luke records is that there is a slave woman, okay? And she is uh, a diviner, right? She she uses divination to tell people's futures or maybe talk to the dead or whatever. But the, the whole point is that she is um, reaching out to demonic powers to know things that normal people wouldn't know. <laughs> and they relieve her of these demons, right? Um, through the power of God, they uh, expel these demons. And when they did that, she lost her her power, so to speak, to tell the future and to do these things. Well, what that meant was her masters lost their income and they weren't real excited about that. And so they had them rounded up, beaten, thrown in jail and put into stocks Stocks are the things, you know, like your hands, sometimes your head are in, right? So they're not just in jail. They're like locked up in the jail. Um, and then something miraculous happens. <laughs> An earthquake happens. Their chains are, they fall off. And uh, they end up talking with the jailer. And the jailer believes in Jesus. And then his household believes in Jesus. And, and all this goes down. And then we come back to Lydia in Acts 16, verse 40. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So here we see that Lydia was important enough to these men that when they got out of prison, they didn't just hightail it out of the city. Okay, they made it a point to go see Lydia before they left. Now, they also saw the brothers. In the Greek, this word um, means just that men believers <laughs> believers that are men um it it's sometimes you know when we see brothers or men it can mean humans right both genders but in this case it's um decidedly masculine so these are brothers that have believed and they left now were these brothers at lydia's house it would appear that they were there is a slight possibility due to linguistics that um, maybe they were in a different location, but it would seem that they were actually in her house. So they were either members of her household that were men or that believed, or they could have been um, men in the city that had decided to believe and they were meeting at her house, almost like it was their church place to meet, right? And so that theory uh, lends some people to say that Lydia was a female deacon. Now, we can't know for sure Right. But deacons are people who serve. OK, at this point in time, what's the difference between being a good Christian and being a servant versus being a deacon? And, and really, the main difference is that when you're a deacon, you're working in an official capacity for the church. OK, as Christians, we're still supposed to serve. Right. And all of us can be deacons in that sense of the word. Um, but, you know, to be a deacon of the church um, is actually more of an official thing. And so people like to debate back and forth on that. So was she a female deacon or not? We can't tell solely by scripture. We can infer some things, but people will come to different conclusions. And so that's where that's at. But we do know she was very important for them in their time in Philippi. It is possible she continued to support them uh, you know, throughout the time. It is also possible that, that maybe she went back to her hometown of Thyatira and helped start the church there, uh, the church that would grow and eventually be included in the book of Revelation chapter two. But we don't know. This, the scripture does not tell us one way or the other, and there's no historical records that tell us one way or the other. So what can we learn from Lydia? After all, she was included in scripture and it's good to know about her and to see, okay, you know, what, what are some things that we can see happening here that maybe are applicable to my life or maybe things I need to keep in mind, right? So we would see uh, from scripture here that God was ordaining this appointment between these missionary men and Lydia, I mean, just think about it. The Holy Spirit literally kept them from preaching the gospel, the very thing that they were on this journey to do, from Antioch, Syria, all the way through Turkey, right, Asia, to the Aegean Sea. That is a long time that they're not doing what they are on the mission to do. <laughs> and that is the Holy Spirit 
guiding them, getting them to Philippi. And we see Lydia. Lydia was not from Philippi, but her life had gotten her to Philippi where she could meet these missionaries, right? And God, of course, gave a vision to Paul to make sure they got there. So here we see that God is ordaining this meeting and he's doing it for a reason, right? Lydia converts. She becomes a believer. Her household becomes a believer. The word starts to spread to where she's got people in her house that are believers, right? And a church is started. There is a church of Philippi in the Bible too, right? So we know that a church is started and it very well could have started right here with Lydia, okay? And for all we know, there could have been another church in Thyatira, but again, theory. So the thing we can see here is that we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance, okay? Paul and Silas and Timothy could have said, you know what? We're going through this area. We're going through Phrygia and Galatia, and we need to be telling people, and telling people about the gospel is a good thing, so we're going to do it, right? Why not? It doesn't make sense that the Holy Spirit would be telling us not to. They could have totally said that, and then they would have delayed, and they wouldn't have gotten to where they needed to go necessarily, right? But because they were sensitive to what the Holy Spirit was telling them, they were able to get there in a quicker manner. They were probably frustrated. <laughs> we don't know that, but I can imagine they would be. Um, but the thing is, is that they were sensitive. They were sensitive to listening to the voice of God and doing His bidding, not necessarily what made sense, but to do what He was asking, okay? And so we need to make sure that our hearts are soft that God uh, can, can lead us and guide us, right? And that we will pay attention and, and follow. We also see that the Holy Spirit was working to prepare Lydia's heart. After all, um, we read it literally in, in God's word that says that he prepared her heart to hear the gospel. And you're thinking, okay, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. A lot of times we take on the burden and responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's his job to convict people. It's his job to prepare their hearts. Okay, it's our job to share God's word with them, to share Jesus with them. But it's not our responsibility or our burden when they don't. Right. And so even though we may be disappointed, you know, we're working at VBS maybe, or we're a Sunday school teacher and, and we're, we're sharing God's word with people and, and we get disappointed that they're not accepting it. That's natural because we want people to be saved, especially if they're family, right? It's so disappointing. But we do not have to feel as if we are failing. We don't have to take on that burden because it is the Holy Spirit that convicts. It is the Holy Spirit that softens their heart. And then it's their choice to listen, right? And so um, I would just encourage you all to, to know that if you are following God, if you're following the Holy Spirit's prodding to, to teach someone or to preach the word or to share your testimony, do it. Do it. And that's a success, okay? And the Holy Spirit, you know, He will convict their hearts. And so I, I think that's an important thing for all of us to remember because sometimes we can we can maybe take that burden on ourselves and feel like we have failed and vice versa. We can take it and say, look what I did, right? When they, when they accept it, well, I got them there. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> Jesus was the one who died. The Holy Spirit was the one who convicted. Uh, they may have used you to get that person there, but, but they did, they did that work. And so just, it's, it's a good reminder of how the Holy Spirit works in, in this process of salvation. So moving on, Lydia, <clears throat> um, did not have a place to worship. And so we see here that despite not having a place to worship, she made sure she sought out fellow believers and they worshiped on their own. Now you have to understand, they were not in a Jewish community. So this idea of, of taking the Sabbath off, right? She's losing money, right? But she's decided to make scripture a priority. She has decided to make God's word a priority. And it said to keep the Sabbath, so she kept it. It said to worship, and so she worshiped, right? And you think, well, okay, you know, whatever. But no, you think back to the pandemic, churches weren't allowed to open, right? In some states and countries, we're talking a really long time that they were not open. What did we do, right? 
Well, people found ways to worship together through Zoom, right? Or, or maybe they met in their homes. I know people met in my home. I, I taught through Zoom. I taught in person, right? But we found other ways to worship and to do life together. And that's biblical. And so we see here that Lydia is doing that exact same thing. They don't have a synagogue, so she finds some believers and they go to the river, right? And that is what making God's word a priority in our life looks like, right? It's saying, okay, um, the normal way isn't working, so how can we obey God and make it happen, right? And so that's what they were doing. Despite being busy, she kept priority of scripture, right? Again, going back to she's not selling goods on the Sabbath. She's not making money on the Sabbath, <laughs> right? And so, uh, but that's what making scripture priority looks like. It's changing our lives to fit God, not changing God to fit us. Okay, so we see that Lydia was not called out of her profession. You say, okay, well, why is that important? Well, some people feel like when they um, accept Christ that they have to stop their job, that they have to, you know, uh, um, only work for the church, so to speak. And that's not the case. You know, um, God uses us in our workplaces. Now, I'll caveat this. If, if your work goes against God's word, um, things like prostitution or, or weapons trafficking or um, things like that, then, then yeah, you, you got to quit your job. But if your job is um, biblical, you know, it doesn't go against the Bible and it doesn't, um, it's not illegal, <laughs> um, then absolutely you can keep your job. Will God call you out of that job? Maybe, maybe not. But God can use you in your job. Think of Lydia and how she, the possibilities of how she could be used, Right. She could help finance the, the missionaries. She could house the missionaries. She could possibly help finance the start of a church, all because of her business. Think of all the people she came in contact with. She came in contact with um, all those wealthy people, leaders, leaders in society who could affect change, right? She came in contact with them. She came in contact with suppliers, with people who were not so wealthy, <laughs> the working class, right? She could affect... Um, the people in her own household who could affect others, right? So she had a long reach. And for all we know, she was affecting people back in Thyatira every time she went back. So you can be used by God in the job that you have, okay? And so um, when you become a believer, you don't have to stop working in that job unless you feel God calling you to, but it's, it's not a foregone conclusion, right? And so look for ways in your job that, that you can be uh, used by God. And so we also see that um, it was not enough to worship God. Okay, so here it is. We're in the point in time where Jesus has been crucified. He's been the sacrifice for our sins. The, it's called the atonement for our sins. He's paid the penalty. He uh, was victory, victorious over death, came back to life, came to earth, and reascended to heaven. And at this point in time, you have to believe in Jesus to get to heaven. And that's still the case today. Jesus said, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me, right? He wants everybody to be saved. But the only way you can be saved is to believe in him. And so Lydia at this point, although she was worshiping God, the Jewish God, right? God the Father, she was not worshiping Jesus. And therefore, she was not a Christian until she accepted the gospel, and believed in Jesus. And that is when she was saved. And you think, well, what's I got to do with today? We already know all this. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> a lot of people think that there are many ways to get to heaven. A lot of people think that Jesus is just one of many fantastic teachers who can get you to heaven. A lot of people think that God is everywhere and in everything. And so they worship everything and that'll get them to heaven. Some people say all paths to heaven are here. Like any religion can get you to heaven. But that's not what the Bible tells us, right? It's through Jesus alone. And Lydia here is an example of that. Until she believed in Jesus, she was not saved, even though she was worshiping God the Father. Okay? So just something to remember and to think through there. Also, um, don't put off your obedience. 
<laughs> Lydia immediately got baptized. And we see this with many of the converts in the Bible, um, the Ethiopian, uh, a bunch of the people where they just immediately wanted to get baptized because that was their first act of obedience. Once they accepted Jesus, right, once they were told the gospel and they knew that Jesus had said to get baptized, they immediately wanted to do it. And then she immediately told her household and they immediately got baptized. A lot of immediates, right? And so what we can see here is that it is important to obey in a timely fashion, <laughs> right? Um, just like when we have our kids, right? If they're slow to obey, they're really disobeying, right? Um, <laughs> you know, funny story about my, my daughter with the dishes, right? She obeyed me by doing the dishes, but it took her four and a half hours. I don't think she was really obeying. That was a heart issue, an attitude issue, right? And so um, it's the same thing with us, right? Uh, obedience in the right way, with the right timing, is what we need to do. And that's what Lydia showed here uh, as she immediately uh, got baptized. But also, she immediately became a servant, right? She immediately said, stay with me. Let me help you. Let me uh, serve you while you are spreading the gospel. And so she was singularly minded on the kingdom of God. And that's how we need to be. All right, so now you know about Lydia. <laughs> and if you want to check these scriptures out, I will provide links in the description. If you want to know more about some of these theories of Lydia and kind of where people get their reasoning, or maybe you want to learn a little bit more about the cities, I uh, highly encourage you to check out the article on my website, also included in the description. And as always, if you like what you see, please share, comment, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you will get notified of any new videos. And I look forward to our next time together.